We now have our call to worship, or something. <laughs> God cares for us completely and calls for our total commitment. Christ gave his life that we might live and calls us to give our lives to him. Through Christ we have died to sin. In Christ we are fully alive to God. Come, let us worship God. Upon a Roman cross, 
and revealed your eternal self-giving love. Forgive us, merciful God, wipe sin from our lives, and let us find ourselves holy in Jesus Christ, our Savior. It is in his name we pray. Amen. into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father so we too might walk in newness of life for if we have been unified with him in a death like his we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his we know that our own self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died in freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will know we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has domination over him. The death he died, he died to sin. Once for all, by the life he lives, he lived to God. So you also must consider yourselves death dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. 
the gospel reading from the, Math, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, the 10th chapter, beginning in verse 24. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the New Testament. Jesus is speaking. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not be made known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid, for you are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have come to bring, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is the word of the Lord. It is a bit of an odd word of the Lord. A lot of challenging sayings, all edited in one little chunk here by Matthew. I've not come to bring peace, Jesus says, but a sword. I will pit a father, a son against father, and a daughter against mother. It's an odd thing for Jesus to say that one's foes will be members of one's own house. I've just come from a conference of Christians within my denominational family. 51% of us have left with more to follow because we are still trying to figure out what it means to love everyone. And so we debate what this means. And I do not necessarily know what the simple answer to that is. I figure if there was a simple answer to that, we would have long since been in the utopia of human life and human existence. Since this is so elusive, we are products of the brokenness of humanity and all those who have come before us. We are still fighting among ourselves. Those who follow Christ together of one house and of one family, we are fighting among ourselves because we are still trying to figure out what it means to love one another. Jesus said that he came not to bring peace but a sword. Because in Jesus there is change. And Jesus calls us into very uncomfortable places. And Jesus calls us to consider very uncomfortable and difficult things. And we are all a part of that. And we do not know what it means to follow Jesus in love. Jesus invites us to go beyond the tradition. You have heard it said to love your friends and hate your enemies. But I say to love your enemies. 
Do good to them who persecute you. Pray for those who abuse you. You have heard it said in the tradition. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Tit for tat. But I say to you, I say to you, if anyone compels you to go one mile, go with them too. If anyone comes to take your coat, give them your extra overcoat as well. Jesus invites us to go beyond. Invite is such a preachery way of saying it. Jesus calls us to go beyond what we know, to go beyond the tradition of our elders, to go beyond what we've always heard. Jesus stands in the tradition of those who came before him. I go back to Micah, uh, probably, I mean, maybe the first uh, Jewish satire comic, you know, I love satire comedy. Um, I grew up uh, with the television character Hawkeye Pierce from MASH. Just love sarcastic comedy. Uh, love the comedy of Jon Stewart, uh, television, The Daily Show for so many years. Micah mocks his own tradition. What is the Lord asking you? He says, almost with a laugh. A thousand rams, thousands of rivers of oil. He's just, the hyperbole of the number would be caught by his listeners. Who could ever come up with that many sacrifices? And Micah says, you know what the Lord is asking of you. Um, do you know what the Lord is asking of you? To love mercy, um, kindness, to walk humbly with God, justice, the prophet says, justice, to live and act justly. And we are still debating what that means, to live and act justly with one another. Jesus stands in the tradition of the prophets who questioned the tradition, the traditions of the elders. John the Baptist leaves the elders and goes to live in the wilderness to question what it is that we have assumed we believed. Jesus stands in this tradition of reformers everywhere who calls us to go beyond what we know and what we've done and what we've thought and challenges us to think in new ways and to grow in a more open spirit. And of course we killed him for it. Jesus stands in an epoch that was reshaping the known world. That at the time that Micah and the prophets are talking about dramatic change within the tradition, Socrates was formulating a radical new way of thinking. And it wasn't just Socrates. In fact, we know very little about what Socrates who he was or what he said, because he left, no, he left nothing behind in his own hand. All we know about Socrates is what his student Plato told us. So we have to assume that was filtered. Somewhat like Jesus, he left no writings behind. All we know about him is what others said, which causes some confusion because people will say different things. But Socrates questioned the traditions and creates a different way of thinking that shaped all of Western thought. It shaped the Roman Empire. It shaped Christianity. It's the foundations of the scientific method, the foundations of the age of reason and the enlightenment. Because Socrates said that we do not in fact have to simply accept the wisdom of our tradition. We do not simply accept the wisdom of our elders. 
We can rethink it. We can reevaluate it. We can ask deep questions, appreciate how we got here from those who came before us, but change and move forward. This is a radical concept for Socrates to present that. And of course they killed him for it. So we still stay now as Jesus said, there will not be peace but a sword. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. But whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And those who find their lives will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. It is worth it enough to lose it all. Following Jesus is worth it to risk it all. And the church that I was ordained in, much like the denomination that many of you have lived your lives in, and that you've come to be with us this morning, are being wiped out because of dissension and anger and fear. And fear is powerful and motivating. And love, eh, we talk about it. But fear is powerful. To quote a philosopher many years ago, that it is said that love casts out fear, but fear casts out love. And reason and everything else And so we are still figuring out and fighting among ourselves what does it mean to love one another. And we would rather go our separate ways and spread vitriol and dissension on our way out the door than acknowledge our own humanity, that we are all in this together and we are all trying to figure it out. The wisdom of the founding fathers of this country wrote in the preamble of our sacred secular document, in order to form a more perfect union, they did not believe that it, what they were doing was going to be perfect. They did not imagine that this was perfect. It was a starting point and a foundation that could be amended, it could be added to we could continue to think this through and figure it out. Believe it or not, friends, Jesus stands in that same tradition. We did not necessarily get it all right with Moses. We did not necessarily understand all that God was saying to us in the law. We did, in fact, not fully know what it meant to love one another just because we were following the law. And Jesus calls us to rethink that and to move forward in a new way. In the same way that God calls Abram to leave his home and to go to a distant place. In the same way that God calls Moses from Egypt into the wilderness, from the wilderness back to Egypt, then from the, again in the wilderness. I mean, it's kind of crazy. Still trying to figure out what it is that I'm doing and where am I going? The God who calls the prophets into the cave and out to see what God is doing. The God who calls John the Baptist to leave the temple, to leave the religious people and to go into the wilderness and to say, well, all of it needs to change. All of it needs to change. The God who calls Jesus, who says that you cannot love God and your money. You cannot serve two masters. You wish to keep everything together, you will lose it. But if you give it away, if you give it away, you will find everlasting life. A God who calls Martin Luther to question, to question the tradition of the elders. He nails a thesis to the door of a castle in Wittenberg, inviting people to come and have a discussion. 
But the Pope considered it an ec a declaration of war. The fact that we would question. And Martin Luther spent the rest of his life in hiding, running from assassins, <coughs> commissioned by the church. Those who are called will face hardship and it will be difficult. It will be worth it, however, to give up our lives. For the sake of questioning, not for questioning's sake, but to question the tradition of our pasts so that we could be more open to the present movement of God's Spirit, a spirit that we have not yet fully received, nor fully understand, nor fully know how to live. I do not know how to love everyone. I have not yet figured that out. There is in the Methodist tradition, as we celebrated, in the spite of all this, we had ordination service, and young people were coming to be ordained into the ministry. And it's such the quirks of the 18th century that in my tradition, Wesley taught the notion of perfection in love. I wish he had used another word than perfection. We ask our ordinance, are you expecting to be going on to perfection in this life? And we expect them to say yes. Though Wesley on his own deathbed admitted, I'm not really a Christian, I never really was, and he's just kind of overcome with guilt. I do not know what it means to be going on to perfection in love. I find it very difficult to love people. I find it extraordinarily difficult to love my fellow clergy who have um, not just left, but who wish to burn as much of it down as they can. I find that very difficult. So I am not claiming that I understand it. I am saying that God is promising us a new way of thinking and a new way of moving forward. And this is good news, friends. That just as John Calvin questioned the traditions of the ancients, the traditions of his day, he was willing to rethink what it means to be faithful in the world. We can do the same thing. And we can be open and we can change and we can move forward in a new way. We are all still figuring out what it means to love one another. And this is a journey that will take us to unexpected places. We just invite you and call you to be open to that journey Otherwise, we're among the last that there will be. We did a demographic study in our church, you know. We all, um, we all must change in love so that we can more fully love each other. Because I believe in a love that is infectious. The more of it we give, the more of it we have. I believe in love that is viral. People do want to be together. People do want to belong. We have to help. We have to help facilitate that. It doesn't just happen automatically. I do believe in caring for one another. I understand the world in which we live our world, we are transfixed by five billionaires and their hubris and their pride who kill themselves in an unsafe submarine while 700 migrants capsize and drown in the Mediterranean. Gets almost no publicity. You know, I can understand that in some ways because billionaires don't drown every day, but poor people drown pretty frequently. And so we kind of pay attention to the strange and odd thing, you know? But that illustrates the brokenness of our world. 
how much attention we will give to a few wealthy people who killed themselves out of their arrogance. And we will blindly ignore and just pass off the poor among us who die escaping persecution and poverty and simply wish to live. So our world is broken and there is much to do. We are still figuring out what it means to love our neighbor. But this is the call of Jesus.
you will, as you, as you may be seated, to join me in a spirit of prayer as we pray together, as Jesus taught us to pray. <coughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The offering plates are at the doors. The plates are by the doors. As you will be invited to share as the Lord has given to you.
gospel is not difficult to understand. It is challenging to live. An invitation to love one's neighbor as oneself is a full-time job. So go as full-time employees of the kingdom of God to love and serve. In the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen.